everybody, uh, our next panel um, is what is the future of political and other violence in the US and around the world? It's moderated by Karen Greenberg, who will introduce the panelists. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really excited about this panel. What is the future of political and other violence in the US and around the world? That's quite a task for a 40-minute panel, but we're going to do our best. First, I want to introduce our panel, and then I'll, we, we will begin our discussion. First, we have Christy Abizade. Christy Abizade is the former director of the National Counterterrorism Center, the NCTC. But before that, she held a number of national security positions in government, including serving during the Obama administration as a senior policy advisor and assistant to the president for counterterrorism and homeland security. So welcome, Christy. Bruce Hoffman will be our next speaker. He's a professor at Georgetown University. He's a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations for Counterterrorism and Homeland Security. And he is the author of many books on terrorism, violence, and related subjects. Most recently, God, Guns, and Sedition, Far-Right Terrorism in America, which I recommend to everybody, as Bruce knows. And finally, we are joined by Mary Ellen O'Toole, director of the Forensic Science Program at George Mason University. She's also the lead researcher on the FBI's 2000 analysis of the school shooter, a threat assessment perspective. And she is also, before that, the author of Dangerous Instincts, Use Use on FBI Profilers Tactics to Avoid Unsafe Situations, which I would like to read but haven't read yet. So thank you. So we're going to get started. Um, I know we're supposed to talk about the future. But before we talk about the future, I think we should talk a little bit about the past and how we've gotten to this particular moment. And in particular, we know from the national security perspective, there was so much focus after 9-11 on Islamic terrorism, international terrorism, the rise and fall of, of, of the terrorist threat after the killings of bin Laden and Zawahiri. Um, but the, the landscape has changed very quickly. And it's changed in two ways. One, the rise of new kinds of terrorism um, abroad and, and sort of a, a disjuncture, but also a coming together of different terrorist groups but also what's happening in the United States with the increasing uh, sense of violence and a violence that seems to be leaderless and maybe non-ideological, maybe not. That's what you're going to talk about. So Christy, let's start with you. Could you give us sort of a broader view of international, domestic, and transnational threats and how you see them um, at this moment in time, but also with a little reflection on what's changed, what's new? Um, so. Yeah, sure. Well, th thanks, and I'm I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, so, we've seen a, a significant evolution in the global the global terrorism landscape since 9/11. I mean, you know, right after 9/11, you're dealing with a, a singular threat, an Al Qaeda threat based in a very specific region of the world, a hierarchical organization that you can understand from an intelligence perspective, that you can find vulnerabilities to attack from an operational perspective. And um, you know, the, that next decade of the, of the post 9-11 era is all about sort of forcing the next evolution of Al Qaeda. You see a disaggregation uh, toward the end of that decade with more sort of branches and affiliates of Al Qaeda creeping up, including one that um, ends up forming the basis of ISIS, which later I think would say I, I, you'd, you'd probably look at you know the second decade after 9/11 and and see how ISIS really defined that that era of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism work, and ISIS's sort of um, innovation, for lack of a better term, was really the democratization of terrorism. They, yes, they had a global caliphate. They attracted foreign fighters from all over the world to that, um, that, that caliphate in, in Iraq and Syria. Um, but, but they also encouraged attacks using social media, online presence. Um, and they encouraged people to attack from where they are. We saw that uh, to really devastating consequence here in San Bernardino and attacks like the Pulse nightclub shooting. And, um, and those two groups sort of defined the national security relevant threat that terrorism posed for a, a good part of, um, uh, of the national security institutions we were dealing with. Now we're dealing with 
a, a much more sort of diverse array of actors that are all active at the same time. Yes, you've got Al Qaeda that's still present and engaged um, in, in different ways, but, but still present and engaged. ISIS is evolving yet again, uh, doesn't have that core sort of territorial uh, hub that it used to operate from, but it is also disaggregated and really leaned into this sort of entrepreneurial version of terrorism. Um, and then you have activity from groups like Hezbollah. You have new ambition from groups like the Houthis. You have Iranian state agents that are encouraging their proxies um, and finding new versions of a surrogate sponsor relationship so they can sort of increase their asymmetric presence across the globe. You have racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists. We often talk about that in the domestic context, and Bruce will be able to school all of us on that. But there is a transnational dimension to it. And, and if we define it too much as a domestic versus international problem, then we actually miss the, the really important linkages that help us understand it as a global phenomenon, a societal phenomenon that we're going to need to address. And so, you know, on the one hand, you have a terrorism environment today that is defined by fewer sophisticated plots than we were dealing with in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. But now you have a broader array of actors, more individuals empowered to act on their own, creating a diversity and a sort of diffusion of a threat environment that actually presents real challenges for the national security institutions that were built for a counterterrorism fight against Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And so how we evolve our model, think about sort of um, the, the law enforcement led, international partnership led, virtual space that today's terrorism threat is increasingly inhabiting, even while those more traditional models are, are presenting threats around the globe. I mean, that's a really important transition point as we're here into this third decade that, you know, frankly, is going to be dramatically changed thanks to October 7th and, and so much of what October 7th has taught a whole new generation of susceptible individuals. Um, one thing I just want to follow up on this democratization, which is an interesting mm -hmm. use of the term, um, which, uh -oh. I mean, we know. But, but one of the things I'm really interested in and, and maybe you could speak about is, you know, we've always thought of terrorism as ideologically motivated. Mm. And so, and the things you're talking about are somewhat ideologically motivated, but where do you see the role of ideology and what you've sort of laid out? Well, I, especially when you're talking about the sort of radicalization path and then the mobilization path of individuals, right? Um, we see sort of an inconsistency yeah. ideologically. Yeah. You have certain disruptions that started out where, where individuals, you know, plan to conduct an attack in the name of ISIS, but really started out uh, in sort of neo-Nazi white supremacist circles. Yeah. And this ability to sort of navigate different online communities, different spaces, including like safe encrypted spaces, and explore ideology as an outlet for whatever else might be um, encouraging an individual to violence, that, that, that does make it very difficult. And the ideological definitions, especially when you're dealing with individuals that are radicalized and mobilized, they're starting to mean less. That's really interesting. And so, I mean, we saw a little bit of that here in the United States in, in the last decade. But would you say that the first sort of urge is to violence and then sort of tagging on the rationale afterwards? Uh, I, mean, I don't know. It's so, it's so highly idiosyncratic. I mean, every okay. individual's experience is their own experience. Um, and, and, you know, some, some will sort of consume extremist content and buy into it and then lead them to a path of violence. Others will, you know, uh, ha want have violent urges and then find that outlet otherwise. So I, it, it's very difficult, at least in, in what I have seen, to, to really tag a clear pattern. Um, what we do know is that, you know, the path to violence is about a, a from radicalization to mobilization is about a 20 month path. Um, if you look at that in the context of something like the post-October 7th environment, I, I am worried about what we are going to experience in, you know, several months' time 
as we think about a whole new generation susceptible to, to wow. this kind of messaging. Wow, 20 months. That brings us to Bruce. Uh, Bruce, you've been studying um, violence, political violence, terrorism for a lot of decades. I won't say how many, I don't want to age us. But, um, but one of the things I noticed in just sort of thinking about your career was that in 1993, you wrote a report for RAND thinking about violence here and just what the, what the trajectory might be. You didn't say 20 months, but you, you know, sort of, how, and you, it was a warning, like, be careful. This is, this is a movement that is starting. It's not going away. It's going to gain strength. Now you have a new book, which is sort of the history of this kind of terrorism in America. Um, and my question to you is, what's new? I mean, you, you lay it out so clearly in this book, which, by the way, you should all read. Uh, no, I'm still. Yes, and it's, Brazil, and it's, 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 really, it, it's, it's really a lot in, in, at one shot. It's terrific. Um, but, but just, you know, you lay it out, and, and you see so many seeds of what we're seeing now. Could you talk about what those, you know, um, what the consistencies are and what's new? Sure. Actually, it was a 1988 report. I gave you the wrong date. I wasn't oh. sure which one you were talking about. Um, it was called, I think, Recent Trends and Future Prospects of Terrorism. And it's the one in the that says, States. look out. It, it did. It oh, did. Um, okay, good. <laughs> I think the big difference is, I mean, back then it charted, a as the book does as well, charted a movement that was becoming more cohesive, that was less disparate and less geographically isolated than it once was. I mean, in fact, some of the things that Christy was just talking about, you were asking her, I mean, were pioneered in that era. I mean, online radicalization was done by the American far right. The concept of lone actor or lone wolf terrorism was advocated right at that period. And the big change then was that there had always been hate groups, racist, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, homophobic groups in the United States. That wasn't new. What was obvious back then, and we t Jacob Ware and I talk about in the book, is uh, the call to sedition, yeah. the anti-government extremism. I mean, now we call Washington, D.C. the swamp. Back in the 1980s, it was Zog, Z-O-G, Zionist occupied government. And that was the big change. And that trajectory has continued, um, amplified certainly today by social media. And of course, terrorism never occurs in a vacuum. It always reflects the divisiveness of the polarization of society. And at the risk of stating the obvious, we're, at a very, we're a very divided country and a polarized country now. And how do you see the role of this leadership, you know, the lack of a leadership structure, the lack of a hierarchy, the lack, how does that affect, you know, whether or not we're really thinking about lone actors or we're thinking about lone actors plus small groups, plus larger groups? Where, where is this headed? Where, where are we now on that? Well, Christy, in, in sort of the top-level view of the threat, really identified it as it is the threat of not lone actors, but of small cells. I mean, look, almost two dozen people were convicted of seditious conspiracy in connection with the January 6, 2021 insurrection. Yeah. That's a serious criminal charge in the United States. You're not going to show up anymore with, like, the name of your group on a patch on your jacket, and you're not going to coordinate ahead of time so that you can be prosecuted by the Department of Justice for conspiring to overthrow the government. It's going to be more like um, the Michigan Wolverines, which were a handful of people that met over Facebook, digital media, uh, many of whom were veterans, so they had the wherewithal to engage in violence. And they're deliberately under the radar. It's much more difficult to track individuals or a very small conspiratorial cell than an actual organization. And also younger. And, so how do you track individuals that are looking at well, younger, and to get into Mary Ellen's realm, and this is not an editorial about the Second Amendment, but they're well armed. And yeah. when you look at some of the polling data, that's also quite new. For example, um, for the first time about three years ago, a University of Maryland Washington Post poll found that roughly a third of people who identify as Republicans and a quarter of people who identify as Democrats believe that in some instance it might be justified to use violence against the federal government. Now that's gone down a bit. It's about 25 percent, roughly 28 percent self-identified Republicans, 12 percent self-identified Democrats. But okay, 44 percent of people who own assault weapons in the United States when asked the question agreed. More than half of people who have concealed weapons permits agreed that it in, these, in the circumstances in America today, it could be justified 
to use violence against the federal government. 17 million firearms were sold in 2020. The U.S. has more, fire, has more than twice as many firearms per 100 people as the next 25 countries combined, and number two is Yemen, which is yeah, a I violent think. place. At 53, we're about 123. So the wherewithal for an individual to engage in violence, whether it's a school shooting or whether it's their own version of an insurrection, is literally within their grasp. So just what about the transnational aspect of this? You know, what you've just described is sort of laying out the domestic context. What about um, contacts between other actors that are foreign actors? Is this, how, where do you see that? Is it, is it not important to the, to the analysis, to the narrative? Where does this lie? Well, I mean, Christy laid it out perfectly correctly when she said that there's no distinction any longer between domestic and international terrorism. So there is. In this social media environment that you're describing, there is both Absolutely. foreign context in that. And it's, and it's worse. <clears throat> the United States, in essence, I mean, I never thought I would see this happen, but you know, 23, 24 years ago, we criticized countries like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan for enabling, for enabling rather, the uh, dissemination of poisonous ideologies, that they weren't doing enough to control it. Well, a lot of our European allies look at the United States that way. I mean, anti-immigrant riots in Dublin influenced by United States white supremacists, groups and ideologies, so this is not an isolated phenomenon. That we see this connectivity. And can I, can I just give of a, course. a specific example of that? So, um, you know, we had a, a mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, <coughs> by an individual who um, was influenced significantly. His manifesto was basically a cut and paste of, of the Christchurch, New Zealand shooter, um, took, took elements from Brevik, from uh, uh, this uh, mass killing in Norway. Um, he inspired an individual in Bratislava to conduct an attack against an LGBTQ plus club uh, outside there. He then lionized um, the, the Buffalo shooter as a saint and encouraged a Bratislava-based individual, encouraged more attacks in the United States to fuel this cycle. So there's nothing sort of, there's nothing domestic or international about these online forums that are transnational, right. that are moderated by people from all over the world that share an ideology and find themselves inspired by each other's acts of violence. It's sort of the, the flip side of globalization and the way we tout it and you know, promote it, and this is what comes with it. It's, which brings us to Mary Ellen. <laughs> Mary Ellen, you've been studying um, violence, criminal violence, sometimes ideologically motivated violence, depending on what's happening at the time. You too, like Bruce, wrote something very early on about um, school shooters uh, <clears throat> when you were working for the FBI. And, um, and yet, you know, and, and w as a warning, look, here's what we have, here's what's coming about, what should we do? And, and this was 2000. So what is new now? And, and your perspective is particularly interesting here because when you just step back from the national security foreign policy concerns, from the sort of sense of the national security state and how, how to function, you look at the individuals, at the individuals, who they are, what motivates them, how to stop them. And could you just bring us into your, your mindset on this and what you've learned over time? So a little bit of the past and then what you see is new now if there is something new. Certainly, and thank you for that question, and good morning, everyone. When I first got involved with looking at mass shooters, I looked at all the cases that we had in the 80s and in the 90s, and it was hard to come up with 17 cases that would meet that definition. And so as I was working on the cases, um, April 1999 came around, and we had Columbine. And the United States and the world had never seen anything like Columbine, the high school shooting. We were really in shock when we saw that. And I'm talking about the FBI. My unit is the behavioral analysis unit with the FBI. So we study um, violence and, and human behavior. I looked at the, the very last tapes that were made by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, which have never been released to the public to try to get a better understanding of motivation, try to get a better understanding of what this case was really all about. We did not see what was coming. We did not realize that this was a watershed event because after that case, 
then we started to see similar cases in that these were individuals that really were enjoying what they were doing. Prior 17 cases, these were kids that were not enjoying what they were doing. They did it, they carried it out, and even going as far back as Charles Whitman, and I worked on that case. I'm not that old, but I did work on that case and studied it intently to better understand what happened there. It was still very different. So now we jump ahead and there's an excitement, there's a fun, there's an anticipation of these new cases that are happening, which was very different. We also did not see uh, back in 1999 how these cases would continue. And just to refresh some of your memory, when Columbine occurred, some of the TV shows at the time were Little House on the Prairie, Friends, um, Frasier was another um, TV program. And now when you look at what is influencing some of these um, mass shooters, the, uh, the landscape has changed un unbelievably. And even Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold could not predict how the landscape would change, just in terms of the influence of something that they did not have access to in 1999, which is social media and real, <coughs> excuse me, the internet. Can we even imagine what Columbine would have been like if Eric Harris had access to social media and the internet at that point? Now, jump ahead to where we are now. And it's predicted that there will be approximately 500 billion devices that will be plugging into the internet next year. There are not enough people in the world to monitor what goes on social media. And the influence alone of that is not even measurable at this point. We're not even really doing research that can capture that. And that's before we even talk about what is motivating some of these young people. And we all think that violence begins maybe with, and it, this is certainly very influential, that violence begins with access to firearms, and it does, and violence begins with other things. But we have learned over the years that violence begins in the brain. How much do we really know about the brain in adolescence? I think that's really where we are right now. And, and what we do, what, what's the relationship between what goes on in the brain and these incidents and being driven to these kinds of acts. I know this is something you've written a lot about and thought a lot about, so. It's so fascinating when you really think about it, but it's, it's so frightening at the same time that these are individuals, and it can be applicable even outside of mass shooters. They don't wake up one day and decide that this is what they're gonna do. They fantasize about it, and sometimes upwards of several years. In the case of Columbine, it was um, at least a year. Um, that we can tell at this point. So we know that violence begins in the brain and we also know that adolescent violence is really influenced by things that do not, that they don't, do not influence adult violence. So it becomes really important that we understand what it is about the adolescent brain, which is immature, highly aggressive, and highly impulsive. And once some of the researchers out there say that the best antidote to adolescent violence, do you know what it is? 30th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> 30th birthday. And I used to say, and I even said to his mother, if we could have pushed um, Dylan Klebold into his 30th birthday, he might right now be in medical school, he might be um, a college professor or something else. But understanding what that what precipitates that violence in adolescence becomes important, and then to understand the social factors, which is domestic violence, the influence of bullying behavior both in the school and at home, all of those factors c come together. Where's our research being done? Our research is very limited, especially when it comes to um, the adolescent brain. And what happens to the adolescent brain when they turn 30? They can begin to develop emotions like regret and empathy. And we're faced with that dilemma as well. We look at the Georgia shooter, just happened last week. What happens when that case is adjudicated and if that person is, is sent to prison, what happens at age 30 or 40 or 50 when they begin to feel empathy or remorse for what they do? So that transitional, 
be tra trajectory becomes important for us to understand. We're not getting funding for that kind of research. So that was my next question, which is, in terms of, pick your term, intervention, rehabilitation, um, for these for youth that seem to be going down this path or have gone down this path, um, do they really have to wait till they're 30, or can interventions help along the way to sort of mature, you know, push the maturation process emotionally, psychologically? We know that interventions can work. That's where you have threat assessment teams that work in schools and, and that work um, in, in agencies. We know that they're very important. One of the things that I've learned over the last 20, 25 years is that we have warning behaviors. We know what the warning behaviors are. We can list them. I can tell you what they are. Just the other day, I heard relative to the Georgia case that if a young person wears goth outfits, that that's a warning behavior. Thinking, who the hell came up with that? That's not a warning behavior. So 25 years later, we're still confused about what warning behaviors are, but it's also imperative that the right people have the, the warning behaviors. Law enforcement can't be in people's um, bathrooms and living rooms, and so it becomes imperative that those warning behaviors are completely understood, they're not marginalized, and they're known to family members. And that's the one thing that I have found is the most difficult. In working with families, I've often found that families may see warning behaviors, but they may tell you things like, oh, that's Tommy. He'll be fine. That's just the way his grandfather was when he was growing up. That's not a big deal. Those were, those were days in the past. We have to appreciate that the right set of circumstances under the conditions that we know adolescents live in today, these warnings are exactly the intervention steps that we need, but they're not really being followed. Wow. Um, Chrissy, I want to turn to all of you to talk about sort of what they want us to talk about in this panel, which is the future. Um, but first I want to start with, and this is about the future, you, you referenced the reorganization of government after 9-11 to deal, to reorganize the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, to think about the threat from Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. Um, and you've seen these agencies um, across government morph and evolve mm -hmm. to take on the threat of domestic terrorism, domestic extremism. Mm -hmm. Are we there? Do we need, is there more that needs to be done? Are there people like, you know, like Mary Ellen that are being brought into the conversation? Well, where do you see this? Yeah, I mean, I'll sort of pick up where Mary Ellen left off, which is, you know, I think we've got to understand how our security structures can be better informed by community level yeah. insight, right? Not intelligence, not law enforcement information, but I mean, if the threat becomes more and more disaggregated amongst individuals, the, the point of intervention and, and the point of awareness really exists not in exquisite intelligence collection yeah. in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but you know, at you know, in, inside a person's home, or you know, in a community where they've observed behaviors that are concerning and could lead to that violence, and how you sort of have humane interventions that are community-based um, and that help inform our understanding as a national security institutions uh, about where the trends are going and what kinds of interventions are going to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always going to be the case that intelligence-led Counterterrorism interventions yeah. are, are the way to combat where the threat is evolving to. And so how you preserve the core capabilities but also evolve along with the threat and marry up communities that otherwise would not have been engaged with each other, that's, that's I think, really tricky in this country but also really important. Yeah. Um, Bruce, would you agree? I mean, in terms of the pivot from really focusing on international terrorism to domestic terrorism, are these the agencies that we need, to, whether it's DHS, whether it's ODN, whatever it is, is this, whether it's the you know, National Security Division of DOJ, um, it, does it really, is it, a, from your point of view, a different skill set? Or do, do you think that it's just a matter of you know, expanding and evolving the skill set we have for d d you know, deterring of violence in this country? Well, as we've all discussed, the, the threat is constantly evolving and changing. So therefore, the way we think about it and the way we react to it has to change and evolve. I mean, and I see that. I, 
I think the biggest challenge is covering the waterfront of threats. I mean, 20 years ago, if we had a conference like this, we'd be talking about Al-Qaeda and only Al-Qaeda. And now we're talking about multiple groups. We're talking about well, certainly the growth in domestic terrorism. We haven't said anything that there's also a threat from radical left wing elements as well as yeah. extremist right wing. So it's a different world. State sponsors are once again active in terrorism. So no, it's, it's evolving and keeping track of what's changing. And we certainly have those capabilities. It's how do we avoid being overwhelmed? And that, of course, is something that you know intimately. How do we avoid being overwhelmed? We can't. I mean, this is just one you know, of so many threats that face us. But I think that's, that's the job of counterterrorism officials and whatever we would call them, security officials. I, I think that's right. And it is overwhelming. And yet you need the same people in the conversation from before so that the expertise of what we've learned, right? Does that? Well, what worries me is that, I mean, there's, there's such a mistrust and distrust of government and even this constant denigration of civil servants. I mean, when I look at my students, it's great. At Georgetown, fortunately, there's so many students that still want to go into government service. Yeah. But I wonder how widespread that is at other universities whether people want to dedicate themselves to the military, for example, to the intelligence community, to the FBI. I mean, who wants to go into law enforcement nowadays? I mean, this is, this is the biggest challenge we face. I mean, the just problem is yeah. that there's been this deficit of trust. Yeah, yeah, well, our students tend to want to go in, I mean, that's what they want to do when they grow up, or they think they're grown up, but when they grow up more, that's what they want to do, right? And they all have the same thing. It's, it is, it you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Marilyn, on the same trajectory here, you know, when you talk about um, the, the individual and the local community. When you talk about that, do, and some people will say, well, we need a better education system. We need teachers that you know, can understand how to nurture in different ways and take care of these fraught personalities and individual psychosis or individual problems. Do you see a need within the counterterrorism uh, and counter-extremism conversation for more psychologists, more forensic psychologists, more understanding of that, or do you think there's enough of an interchange in, in that way? And I, and I mean everywhere from the schools all the way up to government officials. No, I appreciate that question, and, and I've thought a lot about that, and all of those positions would be critical and really important to understand, but I also think we need to have a much better idea of how someone becomes violent. And it's not only the trajectory, but what contributes to it, and what does the general public know about it? So let's say, as we're sitting here today, uh, what if there is a shooting at a local university? I'm at George Mason here in, in um, the Northern Virginia area, but what if there's a, a, a shooting? Someone, someone will walk to the podium and it could be law enforcement, it could be the FBI, it could be um, the mayor of Fairfax. And you might hear somebody say, whoever did this is evil. Whoever did this horrible crime um, is a monster. Or whoever did this crime is mentally ill. That's without knowing all the facts of the mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. And regardless if that were to happen today, just pay attention because you will hear those three terms over and over again, and it shows just a stunning lack of knowledge of what creates this kind of violent behavior. And when you use terms like evil, it has no meaning from a behavioral or neurological perspective. Evil is a spiritual term. If you use the word monster, that catapults us back to the 14th century where werewolves were believed to be responsible. When you say people are mentally ill, most people who suffer from a serious mental illness are less dangerous than the four of us up here. So that lack of knowledge, <laughs> that lack of knowledge is stunning and it has not changed over the last 25 years. And I do think with all of the extra positions that you've mentioned, which are incredible, we need to fund really ongoing strong research in the neuroscience of violence. Keep in mind that to get a really good study in neuroscience can take upwards of two to three years to do it and publish it, get it peer reviewed and out there. <clears throat> Guess what happens in two to three years? A lot more development. So we are so behind the eight ball, it, we should feel stunned. 
and really kind of embarrassed because we're such an educated society. Mm -hmm. That's where we need to focus is what is it about the brain in the adolescent brain and in the adult brain? Mm -hmm. Violence starts in the brain. Um, I beat Peter by, oh no, I didn't. I, we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? I have one. Okay, yeah. So, um, you know, Trump was first. We're lucky that President Trump didn't die in that assassination attempt. And it, it initially, it looked like a political assassination. Um, so basically, two questions. One, um, Tom, his motives seem unclear. Uh, he seems more like a school shooter, perhaps, than an assassin. And we're going into another election season. Clearly, there's a lot of, um, uh, you've just written a book about it, Karen, uh, and which is also available for sale outside. <laughs> uh, but I mean, how concerned should we be uh, for this election season? He's braver than I am. I wasn't gonna ask that question, but um, Bruce, you wanna start? Well, I hate to say it, but I think we should be very concerned no matter who wins. I fear, that's not predicting and it's not suspecting, but I fear no matter who wins, there will be violence. And one can go back to previous patterns and see why that's the case. Do you think that if there's more, you know, if it's a bigger win, there'll be less violence? Let's say if Vice President Harris won, there would be less violence if no. it was a more, no. No, because I see one side, a certain kind of election would provide top cover as it did in Charlottesville in 2017 and for other events. Mm -hmm. But I can see for the other side, just the incessant, the election was stolen yet again. And a second time in a row will bring out even more aggressive and potentially violent behavior. Christy, do you think the, I mean, the, the, the federal government has, knows this. They've been paying attention to this threat. There are things in place to, to address this, both in terms of certification process, but also in terms of just monitoring things on the helping, you know, with intelligence, et cetera, on the local and state level. Mm -hmm. um, we're better prepared than we were? I, I mean, I think we're better prepared, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that you have agencies that have been given license to understand this and to engage proactively with, with local communities, local law enforcement, state, local, tribal, territorial, in ways that, um, was not as common, you know, during the last election cycle. Um, but but I but I think there is a spontaneity. There is yeah. a um, there is you know a, just a, a lot of activity that happens without you know awareness of security services that we've got to be really mindful of. I mean, you know, is it likely that you'll have another sort of rallying point event at the United States Capitol like we saw on January sixth? It, it, I hope that all the deterrent effect of the post-January 6th uh, indictments and, and charges will, will forestall that. But then what does that mean in terms of disaggregated series of violence? It, it, it's certainly a concern. It's certainly a concern. Marilyn, do, do you think that the, the election and the you know, certification process affects individuals, youth, that are tend to be, you know, out of control, violent in that moment in time, or is it really just something that would not filter down to that level, or are they vulnerable to being co-opted into some kind of violent you know, reaction? What do you think? I would say that the youth, we're talking um, young people, certainly under the age of 30, are aware of what's going on. Their in-depth knowledge, though, is very limited. Are they scholars in, what's going, no, they are not scholars. All you have to do is try to interview one of them and you can see that the depth of their knowledge yeah, is, yeah. is minimal. But I will say this, the kind of the emotion and the attention surrounding um, the attempted assassination of former President Trump was not lost on someone who currently, and I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say this, there is already more than one person who is probably sitting in their bedroom or their basement who is already planning to attempt to murder both um, Vice President Harris, former President um, Trump, or another high-ranking person within the government. They're already planning it. And we say that after, after every mass shooting, that they are learning from other shooters. They are studying this shooter from Butler, Pennsylvania. Their heroes are Columbine. 
Um, they're studying, as you brought up, um, other cases up in New York. So they are already studying it, even though we know the consequences of this kind of behavior are so dire and so permanent, it does not matter. That's how focused and that's how committed they are to being engaged with this kind of violence. What causes that? Does anybody here know? That's why the research is so important. You would think it would be an automatic turnoff. I can't do that, because look what will happen. That's wrong, I can't do that. That's not what's happening. We are out of time. Um, but I, I don't like ending on such a scary <laughs> note. Um, but then again, I just read Bruce's book, so you know, whatever. Um, but, um, but let me just say that, to reinforce the good news, which is we are better prepared. We are also not, the interference that happened from the top in terms of law enforcement response would not be the same this time, we assume. I didn't say that. No, you okay, didn't say that. Saying. I said no. that. I <laughs> I'm saying that, um, and um, and um, and thank you so. I'm not going to say anything else, but thank you so much. This was incredibly illuminating and thoughtful. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.